just continue. Yeah. I can go for another like 20 minutes, okay. I think. Okay. Um, right. But yeah, um, wait, can I finish my point? Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah. You so had the thing is one. that. <laughs> <laughs> just Viewers in both of them interrupted me multiple times. I would like you to take note of this. I am being targeted. Hello, dear watchers, listeners, and fellow readers. Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. My entire family thinks our name is too long and thinks it should be one word short, but oh well, we've committed. I like that UTT is way, way closer to UTI than it's possible. I was That's exactly what my sister said. Yes. She was like, because I was like, no, people shorten it to UTT. She's like, Maria, do you hear yourself? That sounds like UTI. And I'm like- It does, it does. That occurred to me. Or a technical university. Mm, uh, yes, That's a does. good point. University of Tennessee the Technical. technical. <laughs> technical I don't know Tennessee. if it exists, but um, I like the pun too much to give it up. She, see, they said textual tension would have been enough. Well, they're not English nerds. Anyway, we've committed. <laughs> this week, we are reading another fantastic uh, tale in the Hyperion uh, first book. This week is the Scholar's Tale, and it's official, guys. We've hit my favorite tale. This is it, baby. I love it. It's pretty controversial, too, online. I was seeing some uh, discussion on what people thought, and everyone's like, yes, we know. Yes, we know. Priest Tale is very good. However, <laughs> however, Saul Weintraub's story is far more emotional and pivotal and impactful than any of the others. And that's what everybody keeps saying. I think what's fascinating is that the poets, or not the poets, the scholar's tale and the priest tale are actually very similar stories in a way that are told in very different, different ways. In that one is horror he decided to go the route of and the other is not horror. And he very specifically made a decision to go a not horror route with it, which I'll talk about more. But like, it's interesting because they are diametrically opposed in that way. And this is, when I talked about like different genres, this for me has a magical realism feel. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I'm going to make some comparisons to the Benjamin Button short story, because that also is magical realism. Brad Pitt was really good in that short story. Yeah, so, he was really good. This short story is actually not magical realism. It functions tonally compared to everything else as a magical realism. It's like everything's normal except one thing's off. It's my favorite and it's really good. But before we get too far, what did you guys think of the scholar's tale? William. Katie, why don't you start? God damn you. <laughs> like, fine. <laughs> okay. It's the difference between explaining why the Mona Lisa is beautiful and why abstract art can be beautiful. Because... You have the traditional beauty of where all your T's are crossed and all your I's are dotted. And structurally, it is a stellar story. But while this story of ours, the scholar story, is that, it's also honestly more evocative when it comes to sentimentality and a whole bunch of other really close emotions that made me sob hard in the car while I was driving back from my chiropractor appointment, nearly getting into a side swipe, I then called Maria and yelled at her for not warning me. <laughs> and at the time, I want you to know, she cried at a completely different point than where I cried the first time I listened to this. Uh, so when she was like, yeah, I'm like a fourth into the story, I was like, oh no, that is... I also thought that the Saul's perspective in this tale is very... Banal. It mundane. Yeah, I like I like that nod. That simultaneous nod. Thank you. Thank you. I too can analyze literature. I thought his tale reflected the religion, the detachment from religion, and the bitter hatred towards really cool things that we'll discuss later. That Saul doesn't actually show, but that the situation can show. Like for example. There's a part where Saul is dealing with the idea. He's not very religious, but he's having a dream where he thinks God is speaking to him. And his retorts, his belligerent responses in response to the God, heavy emphasis, uh, emphasis on the quotations, God, um, is just to slap it back in the God's face and be like, nah, bruh, like, 
I'm not that religious. And I really liked that. It's because it really shows like a part of how religion has changed over time. Yahweh or the highway. Yeah. Okay. What kind of <laughs> bumper sticker bullshit is that? I read this after Katie had called me crying about it. So I was like, oh shit, I better read this in one day. And I actually found it more heartwarming than sad or horrific because like he really loves his daughter and that's sweet. He's so bittersweet. And I think the thing about it is, as I was saying earlier, there is a very distinct decision he makes to not take this into horror territory because it is absolutely horrific what's happening to the second sort of main character in this but he doesn't focus on that portion of it he focuses it in a different way and instead of like maria said it's very much a magical realism story because it's not focused on trying to deal with the mechanics of the situation or the science of it but the morality of it and there is a sense of like everybody just kind of takes for no, granted that this weird thing is happening, which is a very magical realism idea. The one thing I will say is I'm not sure thematically how well it comes together in terms of the religious argument. And I'm not sure how much of that is just that like Dan Simmons is engaging with a level of like uh, Jewish- Rhetoric. Literic, and I just am not really fluent in it. And how yeah. much of it is just like, you know. So, I mean, that's an interesting thing that I probably should have researched before this. Clarification. Um, what are you wishing you had looked up before this? What particular part about? How Jewish people, people who study uh, the religion, look at the portrayal, specifically the moral dilemma that is couched within the Jewish religion that he has. I tried looking up and I found a couple articles looking at uh, Rachel uh, as a Jewish woman within the story. I only found one I could read. The other two were behind paywalls. <laughs> um, but it was mainly like, ah, ah, this is why we can't do live shows, William. God damn it, because you just, you can't not walk through. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, but it's the worst part. Katie and I, like, I'm laughing at you, the amount yeah, my of reaction pleasure over. you're having in this, but it wasn't funny. It's a little funny. No. Anyway, I had tried doing some research into it. Uh, now, granted, it was a cursory glance. I have had a very busy week. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have done more into this because I actually am really fascinated. So if any of the viewers are of Jewish descent or, like, really keep up with Judaism studies and have read this story, what are your interactions with it? Like, none of us are Jewish. I'm really interested into that side of it. And like Will said, I don't know how to fully engage with that aspect of the story, other than just how the story functions as a whole and what that plays just into the general morality um, separate of like Judaism. We'll see as we get closer to that part portion of the story. Yeah, so it seems like we we all enjoyed it. Indeed. Do you want to break down the, uh, the premise and the plot, Maria? Story time, children. So this story picks up as far as uh, oh yeah, because we have to do the like the pre-plot. There isn't really any pre-plot this time. Like there really isn't. Uh, the barge that they were on, the Benares barge uh, that was from Earth, the manta rays died. They had time to kill. They had to wait for a wind wagon. So they were like, "Let's tell a story." So Saul Weintraub is next, and he starts telling the story. Saul Weintraub's story is probably, I think, the most difficult to convey as a like. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the plot because the plot itself doesn't actually matter. I'm going to mention some of the like minor details when I'm going to talk about the mundanity and how that helps it. But as far as like the plot, it's going to be like, then they were on Barnard's world raising her backwards, then shit got crazy and they had to move to uh, Hebron. And was that the name of the... <gasps> you don't know the name! I think it is Hebron. The shoe is on the other foot! It is Hebron, so fuck you. <laughs> And New Jerusalem, though I don't remember the city that they ended up living in. But anyway, like I was saying, Saul Weintraub's tale is the hardest to retell as far as plot because the plot really does not matter. Uh, what matters are the emotional beats that happen. So I'm just going to rush through this pretty quick, guys, couch you in the important things that you need to know. And then as we discuss the things we liked, more of the details and the emotionality of it will be fleshed out. So Saul Weintraub is married to a lovely wife, Saray. They live on a little rinky-dink planet that's like literally, it's like the Iowa of the, the <laughs> hegemony. Like it's, it's cornfields and then a university. It's described as so flat for so many miles 
that you could see like essentially the sun rise like on the other part of the freaking planet type of thing. It's a crop world and then there's a really famous prestigious university which is where Saul Weintraub works because he is a scholar. He met his wife Saray at university after she got her doctorate. She's a music person. They have a really cute little romance. And then they have a daughter, Rachel. And Rachel grows up to be like an archaeologist. So at this point, if you've been following along or if you've been reading yourself, you're thinking, huh, um, so Weintraub has a baby during this pilgrimage. Her name is Rachel. This baby he had previously that is currently aging and above the age of said baby is also Rachel. Oh, no. This is going to be really depressing. What is happening? So Rachel is a great like kid. You get a lot of really interesting tidbits about like her personality. And um, I think he does a good job in this beginning part of the tale kind of painting Rachel growing up. But Rachel eventually uh, works for a a, like cool university and she's going to different worlds and looking at interesting artifacts. And she ends up getting put on a team to go to Hyperion and study the time tombs. And at this point, not a lot is known in the web worlds about Hyperion, really. The, her dad's like, isn't that where like the one labyrinth, isn't that one of the labyrinth worlds? And then mom's like, and isn't that where the strike is? And she's like, mom, that's a myth. Nobody's, it was probably the weird worms in the sea of grass killing people that people didn't get and they're like okay have a nice time we'll miss you and they really do anytime rachel's gone the house feels empty they really love having her there she goes off she's there for about a year and um she has a time deck it took her seven years to get there towards the end of the year that she's there and at this point the story kind of cuts i hadn't mentioned this this is in third person kind of a distant third person and mainly we follow saul but there's a period where we follow rachel towards the end of her first year on hyperion Uh, And you learn that she is dating her co-researcher, Emilio? Emilio, good job. Yes. Oh, what is up today? (laughs) Uh, I remembered (laughs) it. But uh, her co-researcher, Emilio, they're they're a cute little couple. Um, And what they do is they want to try study the time tombs. And they've they've worked on the Sphinx because there's a lot of anti-entropic fields. And they they can only do research when the fields have pulled back enough that they're not going to get caught in them. At certain hours, they can get into the Sphinx. And what they're trying to do is see like where pockets and openings are. This is really reminiscent of the mummy, honestly. Um, It really felt kind of cozy and like a romantic like adventure novel, the way it's kind of the, the way the settings set. It's because we still have third person limited and we're still like we've sw- switched between Saul to Rachel. But it's just like Rachel's with her lover. They're sharing a tent. They're going out in a Jeep out to this place called the Sphinx where like there's just a whole bunch of corridors. They're like ma- like almost like a termite maze, I feel like. And the time right? That's what Maria is talking about is the time things that can affect you. It's because the time. The anti-entropic fields. fields. Exactly. So just layman's terms. The time waves. Um, this space is supposed to be 100% safe. The tides don't go up that place. And well, it's no, all they do, range. but at certain, it's like actual tides, like during, from this it's time. It's during typhoons. The- it's during typhoons, they say. The kind of vibe of a typhoon. It's because usually uh, it doesn't reach that far. Yeah. Um, except for on certain nights. But the point I'm trying to make is is it's very cozy and it kind of romances you a little, especially since Rachel's so endearing. And then... And then one night, so originally her and Amelia were going out together and then they realized, nah, one of us can fucking sleep. <laughs> and one of us just goes. And they've, they've got, because the, like Katie said, they're kind of like these weird tunnels that go really wide and then they'll get really skinny and some you can't even fully like get an arm through. Um, but they've created like with lights and hanging little lights, uh, glow lights, they've made a path for themselves And she goes and she's running her tests and doing her things. And then all of a sudden, like, she's kind of dozing. And all of the machinery starts going crazy um, around her. And then everything just shuts off. And she hears heavy footsteps in the cavern above her. And she is just frozen in terror because it's so dark. Like, she's literally paralyzed with fear and it is a gripping scene because katie is right it did romance you a little bit and if if not romance like let's say you weren't romance you were just there there was a sense of again mundanity like she'd done this night after night there was nothing like odd or weird about it and then boom as i said Simmons it's is- a horror story it becomes a horror story Simmons in that really moment. good at doing it 
it's really fun. It's because during the scene, I could really feel the claustrophobia because as Rachel tries to escape, she finds that the walls have changed and the tunnels from what little she could gather have completely changed sizes and everything. So it's almost like this is morphing into a different place entirely. And there's a slow creep. And right before all the sensors turned off, it showed massive new spaces that had appeared. And she's like, what the fuck? That's impossible. And again, everything turns off and it shouldn't. None of this is running on stuff that even in a nuclear blast, it would shut off. So she's truly freaked out. Something real weird is going on. And she has to follow the light, the the wires that the lights were going. And she's like trying to pull herself along. And then all of a sudden, there's something else there. And then she blacks the fuck out. And you as a reader are like... The Shrike. Well, also, because she loses three fingers. She touches something and loses three, three fingers, fingers. And you're like, she's like, that's what was the that? But anyway, so it's this engaging scene. And you're immediately like, what the fuck? And then it switches back to Saul. And he's like, it had been 11 years since they'd seen Rachel. And suddenly they get a call. Oh, actually, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a full 11. But like, she'd been gone for like eight years. And they find out that she had... There's been a huge accident. And she's being shipped to Renaissance factor um to a hospital yeah and prior to this Saul has a nightmare and that nightmare oh, the, the is night that very Rachel prophetic. did her thing yes it's very prophetic and what he has is he's wandering in a temple that uh <clears throat> just so happens to be described as not unlike the Shrike temple um but anyway he's walking through a temple and uh there's a couple of things that's things that happen and it's more like an interaction with what he thinks his religion represents and he gets a voice that booms no but also the glowing red orbs just like in the priest tale saul is walking through this temple in his dream there's a booming voice overhead and it says saul take your daughter rachel the only daughter of of whom you love and bring her take her to a hyperion to a place that i will tell you and offer her as a burning burnt offering or at, and offer her at a burnt offering at a place that of which I will tell you. What happens is that then Saul wakes up and he gets a communication that Rachel, there's something that's happened to Rachel and they're coming to one of the webway worlds and they have to wait like eight months till they figure out what happened because of time dilation. And once he gets there, Rachel is in a coma. But once he gets to the actual hospital, he's like, okay, what happened to her? And they're like, um, Something kind of weird. She seems to be aging in reverse and we don't know why. And like Saul is very kind of chill about this. This is one thing I actually really like is that Saul is such an ordinary guy. Like he really is just a professor dad. And the way he handles everything is just like as a professor dad. But then Rachel wakes up and it fi- they find out that every time she sleeps, it resets so that she's a day less in her memory. So she's going backwards in time. And they cannot figure out why. Rachel is also really chill about this. Like she's remarkably chill. And this is the first moment I was like, oh, okay, Dan Simmons is not going for horror in this short story because she is remarkably like kind of practical about it. She leaves herself notes. And then, you know, she's like, okay, this happened and that happened. And then at one point later, she tries to go to university for some reason. So there's a there's a, there's a a certain amount of like, again, this is magical realism where it's a little bit more mentioned that this is insane than it would be in a magical realism story, but it still has that tone of the absurdity of mundanity kind of a thing. The other thing that lends it to that is Simmons cuts away. Like you never see it until she's younger. You never see Rachel wake up and have the realization. Or if you do, it's like she wakes up, she's a little, like she's like, what? And then they put like a thing in front of her. You get one description and Rachel gives it later about what it's like processing this information day after day and how long it takes her to do so. And so I think part of that is like, like he, he specifically like cuts away. Like we don't get put in Rachel's head Ever yeah, wearing again. Saul's and Saul has that kind of like there's a very specific quality to like middle-aged dads where like they're like oh okay kiddo if you tell them something crazy and they're just slowly processing it and like that's how Saul is about a lot of this stuff I feel like he sees like oh distantly this is kind of happening and I care but it's taking me a while to like okay you're like trans or gay or came out or something but i'm just like okay do you want to go out and like go get coffee or like there's a quality to Saul of that that i just find really funny one thing i wanted to point out was she did still have her lover emilio and he tried really hard to stay with her but it's just like all those awful amnesia romances where 
She keeps trying to leave notes to herself to remind herself who he is, their memories together, but then it starts to haunt her. She gets younger and intimidate her. And then she keeps trying to pursue the same goals she wanted to pursue at the age she was when she was properly aged. And it's just this really sad reverse of dementia where she's forgetting and it's the death of identity versus the death of the physical body. And that's what's really heartbreaking is to watch her forget those memories, forget those people. And she's wiped clean like a board and she's not anymore Rachel. Yeah. And the thing about it is that like, it's also for her parents, you start feeling this of like, you want your child to have a future and they're looking at taking care of this being that has none and was constantly just like, you can't think like, oh, she's going to go to college. It's like, she's not, she's not going to keep going anywhere. And considering my deep seated fears of like, aging and dementia and loss of identity and death like i would think it would hit me as hard as it did katie but for some reason I, it didn't quite and i think for me it's because simmons does kind of put that distance there um that you're able to think of it more dimensionally there's a part later where a younger a much younger rachel sees pictures of herself when she was an adult and i like that was the only moment where like it hit me that, like oh shit like how weird is that that all of what you were is gone and you can't remember any of it. and it's it's really heartbreaking again initially she's trying to like leave videos for herself and at first like i think will or katie mentioned she tries staying with emilio for about two years but they had only been dating two years before this happened so at a certain point like katie said she doesn't remember who he is or the she remembers being friends with him but not dating him and then she doesn't remember who this man is who she keeps waking up for, uh with she tried graduate courses but every day she just forget the next day's lessons and then she's like i should have probably done undergrad and then she ends up coming home um and she's not like she doesn't look super young but saul notes uh, there's a lack of confidence that she had gained in the two years she's now lost. This is the part that got me bawling my eyes out in the car was when uh, Rachel's in the station or th the transport area that she's in and she's waiting for her father to pick her up and she sees her father. And of course, from her perspective, she's much younger and time hasn't passed. So she imagined her father as a younger man and her father, who's bald essentially now comes up and he is so strong for her in that moment because she like you can she, he sees her break a little bit in the recognition that time has passed but she doesn't remember it and instead of him breaking down totally as well even though he does cry he still stands really really strong for her just like she he did during the nightmare that he had where he essentially spat in the face of the god voice and was like no i'm not gonna offer my daughter for anything it's one of the few things that he loves she moves back in and at first like again she's watching the hollow tapes of herself from the previous days she's they, they're trying they keep telling her every morning when she wakes up this is what happened watch this video from you from yesterday and like um at one point she tries to have uh it's her birthday but it's now going to be like her 22nd birthday and all of her friends are in her 30s because due to time dilation, not only in her traveling to Hyperion and back, her friends are in their 30s now. And she would have been younger than them. Like she would have been like 26 if she this thing hadn't happened. But now she's like 22 again. And she invites all the people who had been to her first like birthday party, but they're like adults and they have kids, some of them. And at the end of it, she just turns to her parents and she's like, never let me do that again. There's a hilarious moment where one of her friends is annoyed that she's so young looking. Which I like was jealous. Hilarious. She's like, uh, and I just thought that was a really funny moment. The next really noticeable thing um, that happens is eventually after enough days like this, she goes to her dad and she's like, hey dad, can we have a drink? And he was like, yeah, sure. It was, it was the day before her 21st birthday. Her last day being 21. Uh, and she sits down and she tells him, I haven't slept for 30 hours. I've watched every single hollow tape. I've read every single thing. I've looked at all the pictures and fuck it. I, I, I don't know who that person is. The girl in the hollow tape telling me this stuff. I don't know who the fuck she is. And I kind of don't care. Like I know, I believe now this is happening to me. Like I know, I know it's happening and it's real, but learning about all of her issues and getting baggaged with her trauma 
I, I don't want it. I don't deserve her pain. I don't I'm deserve her. her pain. I'm not her. And what I find interesting is it's like, in many ways, the story is like about dementia, but in this way, it's different in that with dementia, you are still the experiences you had up until that point. But in this case, this is literally another person that exists that she will never be. She is all of her experiences up into that point, but not after. And so, yeah, why should she have to live with this pain that's not hers and didn't really happen to her mind, um, which I thought was like very interesting. And this is one of those moments too that like it did hit me a little bit because when I was young, I had an absolute terror of falling asleep because I was never sure the me that fell asleep would be the me that woke up. And that's exactly what she talks about, about staying up late, where it's like, I don't want to go to sleep because I won't be me when I wake up, I'll die. Um, and so like that did hit me pretty hard. Specifically sleeping? It was, a, it was a problem when I was really young. I would stay up really late and like my mom would get annoyed because she's trying to sleep and I would just try to like stay awake and stay awake. And then if I think about it now, uh, it'll come back and it becomes a problem because like I need to nap and I just will keep not doing it because like it's ugh. so like that moment did kind of hit me. This moment for me really hit me because it is presented in this really like it, it's presented in a way that like any parent child having their first drink together and getting drunk together kind of conversation where they go into something deep and meaningful about their lives. Like you've seen scenes like this before. This is not a weird dynamic. They're two people who love each other. Their life for the most part is fairly routine despite the fact, and again, that's where this magical realism bit, they've got a routine. Like they knew like Rachel wakes up, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. It hits you because it's this mundane scene. It's a dad and his daughter who's 21 ha having their first drink together, getting getting tipsy together, and they're sharing stories, and she just divulges, all, like, this pain, what she's... And she says that it takes her a full... By the time she goes to sleep, she has just begun to come to terms with the fact of what's happening to her, and then the next day she wakes up, and the whole thing starts again. Like, it's just this constant cycle of suffering. <laughs> and so he says, well... What do you want us to do, kiddo? And she's like, don't tell me. Just don't. Let let it let me be. And he goes, he goes to show her something. There was something that she mentioned. And he goes either to get a dr another drink or something, but he's like, yeah, no, that's fine. And he comes back and she's fallen asleep finally. Like, like finally she's gotten this confirmation that tomorrow when she wakes up, the cycle's not gonna start again. And she finally falls asleep. And it is just so, because, like, he carries her to her bed. And it's just, like, Saul Weintraub is such a good flipping papa. And he cares so much about his daughter. And it's just a beautiful, like, it's a fantastic scene. Um, and then from then on, it's just him and Saray trying to construct their life to make things as easy for Rachel as possible to the point where they've never been super rich. So they've never gotten pulsing treatments. Pulsing treatments are how you stay young and, and you look young and they can't actually afford pulsing treatments, but eventually it gets to the point where like them being so old is fucking with Rachel. So they have to get enough to take off, like instead of looking like they're 70 to make them look like they're early fifties. Um, and then, you know, like they styled that they, they look at old family photos to dress like they did back then to style their hair the way they did back then. They just try their hardest to construct things in a way. It's like the 51st States movie. If you've yes. ever watched that, where it's like, they tried to trick her into thinking every day is the one from that time period. This is when the story really kind of shifts its focus to being more about Saul and like, so like the media gets involved in what's happening and they have a whole bunch of paparazzi. And so they have to move to a Jewish commune where like they can kind of be more quiet and safe. And it also throughout this whole period, Saul has been having these conversations with God while he's asleep or God. He is an ethics professor. I don't think we mentioned that. And one of the stories he talks about and thinks about a lot is the one of Abraham, I think is yes. right. And his son Isaac. That's the one where um, God is a needy girlfriend and is like, if you love me, you'll kill your kid for me. And that's a Louis C.K. bit. I didn't come up with it. And um, and then once oh my it gets God, to are the- are you serious? I thought you were like, I genuinely thought that you just pulled that out of your armpit. <laughs> Katie was that, very impressed. that worked out. Yes, uh, I no, was. Uh, and it's... now I'm really disappointed. So that's the story where, again, God tells him, hey, if you love me, you'll go kill your child on the mount. Abraham brings his kid there to kill him. And then God's like, psych. 
Stay your hand. You don't actually need to. And the whole point is like, Saul's like, it doesn't matter that God said no at the very end. Abraham was willing to kill his child. And this is framed as the first like sacrifice of the Jews or in their covenant with God. I don't totally remember how that's framed, but it is framed sort of like that, where like the first the first act they had to do was be willing to sacrifice their children to him. And then the second one that he talks about later, and again, this is Simmons, this is not me, and I'm assuming he's at least somewhat engaging with the Jewish thought on this, is that the Holocaust was the second winnowing where they had to be willing to sacrifice themselves for their children. Another story might frame fixing Rachel as like a scientific problem. This story frames it in the religious sense of how does he help his child and how does he appease God? And so at one point, Saray says like, we have to sacrifice ourselves for her. And he goes, no, that was the second test that we passed. It can't be the same one. Yeah, we've already done that. Something more is needed here because this whole time, Saray has also been having the dreams, but she didn't tell him about it because in her dreams, he's with her and they just like didn't communicate, which I, you know. She thought he knew. That the whole yeah. time that <laughs> she was in his dream. And it's a great scene because at this point, Rachel's young and Saray is like, fuck this while she can still talk and walk. We're going, pack your bags. We're going tomorrow. Like she is ready. She's like, we have to sac- like take Rachel. And he was like, how do you know about the dream? And she's like, of course I know about the dream. And he also realizes she's been seeing something different because she's like the golem. And he's like the golem. And she's like, yeah, before you get into the room, there's a golem and and you as a reader are like, oh shit, that's distract distray. Is she just a big Lord of the Rings fan? And- <laughs> golem spelled the other way, guys. Yes, golem spelled the other way. It's a really uh interesting scene because you realize like she's having a slightly different dream than he is, but they never clarify because she's getting really freaked out about this. And and like Will said, he has come to the conclusion that that's not the answer. They, there's another choice here that he has not yet found. And he's like, you know what? You need some time away. They've tried to go back to Barnard's world, their original home a couple times, but every time they go, the paparazzi is on them and they're using, because when they go through the- Webway? Farscape portals. Something like that. The something. Anyway, when they go Webway through- Webway is portal, from the Elder in Warhammer 40k. <laughs> when they go through the, the Farcaster portals, it tracks like who's going through. And so people, like it pings on Rachel. And so every time they get to, by the time they get to Barnard's world, there's people there by day two. So it's never like a peaceful time. So he's like, listen- I'll stay with Rachel for a few days. You go visit your sister. Have a nice, relax for a week. And then when you come back, you can take care of Rachel and I'll work on my book. And he says it's not because he actually needs a break uh, and needs to, like, he loves spending time with his daughter. At this point, she's at an age where it's almost easier. Like, they just tell her, like, you know, you've been sick. It's like uh, you've you've forgotten a couple things, but it's like don't worry about it. And and she's young. We're on vacation. That's why your room looks different. That's why we're on a completely different planet, and the rest of your family isn't here. And he doesn't mind that. He enjoys his time, but he knows that by making Saray feel like you know, if you go, then I'll get a break afterwards. It it'll make her go. Um, and Saray goes on the trip. Uh and then dies in an EMV accident. And EMVs are supposed to be like the safest form of transport that there could ever be. And they're basically killed by the equivalent of a drunk EMV driver. It is super sad because Saul is absolutely not expecting it. And how do you deal with the death of your wife with a daughter who remembers her mother being alive? He has to tell her on three days or four days. So four times he has to tell his daughter that her mother died. And I was like, why would you do that? Just do it once. <laughs> like <laughs> He doesn't do it much afterwards. I mean, he gives up and he just ends up saying, ah, your mother's away on vacation visiting. And it's just really depressing. It's because at this point, everything's finally fallen apart with his little family. And he doesn't have anyone anymore. Now, at this point, he starts trying to get, because what happened is earlier, Emilio, I can remember names when they're Hispanic, had sent an expedition back to Hyperion to try to study the entropic tombs more, but he couldn't figure it out. And there's a very creepy, or not creepy, but just uh, like uh, scene where when he comes back, Rachel's in like high school and he doesn't really want to see her because like that's, thankfully Dan Simmons realizes that's weird because Dan Simmons doesn't always, um, from what Maria has told me about the rest of the series. Um, <laughs> 
But um, anyway, and so he tells Saul, like, we couldn't figure it out. And like, what's weirder is that like the hegemony and the Shrike church are kind of resistant to people figuring out what's going on at Hyperion. So at one point, Saul goes to see the church of the Shrike and they kind of know what's up. And when they figure out that he's Rachel's father, they're like, okay, no, get out of here. Like she's been both blessed and cursed and we don't want anything to do with it. At this point, he starts trying to go on news programs to build up like pressure so that he can get to Hyperion before Rachel disappears in like 12 weeks or something like that. Yeah, and it wasn't just a denial of service by the Shrike cult. It was literally as if they had heard the word. Imagine any cliche scene you could have possibly seen about the devil's like son, like the Damien concept and seeing the tattoo of the 666 and then the whole church becoming cats near water and just being like, And then, I mean, that's essentially what happened. Mm -hmm. He billowed up in his big, tall form and he told Saul, GTFO. But then, like Will said, Saul is like, I want to go on a Shrike pilgrimage. I need to go. And at this point, he has made the decision because he finally, like, after Saray's death, he's like, what am I? I can't do nothing. I'm not going to sacrifice my daughter, but I'm going to go. Oh, the reason he hasn't gone before, by the way, is that to go through space in a fast way, you have to go into fugue state, which is like a coma, or you'll go insane, which is kind of what happened to um, what's his face from the last story, the poet. In this case, Rachel can't go into it, and they don't know why, really. So, like, going to places in a spaceship has just not been an option. But at this point, he's like, she's like, three months old like we got to do what we got to do he talks to the rabbi before he leaves because at this point like they're basically dealing with like like will said a three month old and so the community on hebron has come together and like people are there to like wait rachel's gonna wake up in the middle of the night and cry they've got people to help and they're like no no no, we'll take care of you and he's like nah i have to believe there's hope i have to have some sense of hope that there is something to be done for my daughter. And he is just fueled. Because, like, one thing we haven't mentioned is, despite the fact that this is a moralistic religious journey that he's going on, um, as far as him coming to terms with needing to do something, there have been, like, he knows enough that he can hold his own in discussions with doctors, specialists. Like, they'll say something, and he'll be like, but what about this other thing that completely contradicts that, you dumbass? When he's talking to God, he's, like, railing at him and telling him how dumb he is from a moralistic perspective, and, like, all the things as an atheist you wish you could yell at God. He he notes this because it's when he's awake, he has these conversations. The dream is, you know, with the Shrike. I don't know, God, we, you don't know. But when he's awake and having the arguments, he's arguing with his subconscious as God. And it's just really because like there are times where you're like, is it God? Is it just his subconscious? It's fantastic because they duel and he very rarely wins. And then there is a point where he thinks he's won and he's like, waiting for a reply. Um, and so they're they're just really great. And the way he speaks is fantastic. And basically that's how the tale ends. Congratulations, he's going to Hyperion and then you know what has happened since then. The other thing that it happens, and again, I don't quite understand this, is that he has a last vision with God while they're on the fugue ship on the way to Hyperion where he says, he tells God that like, if you want us to love you, you have to come down to our level. And that's sort of, framed as like the third sacrifice things that religious covenant Jewish people have to do. But I didn't really understand it. And I think, again, it has something to do with Judaic lore. I think it's also the idea that we are, because it's the idea was killing innocents. There's this whole thing about killing innocents. Yes. And it was in the original one, because he said like Isaac was an innocent, but then he, he reasons no a- Abraham was so young, like the world was so young, humanity was an innocent, so it needed God to come in as someone to tell it to, what to do. And thus, God tells, uh, and again, I, I took this more as a religious commentary in general, um, because, you know, this is also like... This is the third Dan Simmons story in this book about religion. <laughs> and so I, like, we've had a priest, we've had a Muslim guy, and now we're... So I, it feels like a commentary on religion itself. Again, I would love viewers... Listeners, if you have any thoughts about the like interaction of uh, this story with Judaism, please give it. Stage one of humanity as innocence as a whole and ch- childlike, and thus it, it needs to be told what to do. There's a philosopher whose name I am blanking on, um, where this is like an element of his philosophy where like at first you need like a god 
uh, and, and religion to like give you direction. Uh, and then eventually like you morally grow to the point where you don't need it and you can question it. I'm going to remember this in the middle of the night and it's going to kill me. But anyway. Um, and so then during the Holocaust, it was like they could sacrifice like as adults could sacrifice themselves for children. So it was like you're still within like it's still almost like a service to God. Um, but there's a maturity that comes. And it, the idea is now they need to love, like the love needs to be for themselves. So before it was like God was giving love to them and then they, through God, were giving love to their children. And now it's like, as a, as a ray, as a humanity, you, you need to choose us. That makes a lot, a lot of sense, I think, thematically. By the way, this is why I set up this podcast partly is because when you talk with smart people, you come up with smart ideas. <laughs> and like, even just in this talk, like I've come up, I've realized like, oh, the, the um, ma- magical realism thing is like, that was a thing I felt but didn't quite know about. I love, by the way, uh, uh, viewers, in one of the comments uh, complaining about me because we get a lot of those and I just nuke them, they were saying that I was stealing all of Maria's points in the Savior's Sister and Savior's Champion. And I'm like, how do you steal someone's points when you just agree? But you know. <laughs> I made them and then he uh, went, and- oh, Maria said that this was my idea. <laughs> I, am so, yeah. them. I don't understand how that works, but um, if I could, I would. <laughs> I have there good ideas. Ahead. But yeah, no, I think you're correct. I think that's the uh, progression of it. And it makes sense with Dan Simmons' overall atheistic views. And again, this is the third story where religion has been a really big part. It was in the priest's tale, and then it was a little bit in soldier's tale. And now here it is again in the scholar's tale, back in the forefront, almost even more. Saul Weintraub himself, as we said in the beginning, is not very religious. This is the first time he's really getting, like, putting his research towards the religion he's part of and becoming closer to it. And I think there is something really nice of the, the world of Hebron welcome him in because like their, like their life is chaos and they just get a little letter from Hebron being like, when it gets too much, come here. Nobody is allowed. No visitors are allowed past new Jerusalem. So you will never be bugged. And like, eventually they had to do it. Thematically, I like the progression of that. Like his going from like the first sacrifice, the second now, like I must choose preservation of me and mine and it's it's a fantastic progression again any feedback anyone would like to give or articles or anything we could read i am totally here for like discussing this absolutely i've had a busy week so i didn't have a chance to do as much as i wanted in general if you guys ever want us to read something more or have any like real thoughts on it we would love to hear them i mean again discussing smart things with smart people is always fun and you guys often put really like fascinating things like there was in our savior sister video some people just had such great comments and things that i wanted to engage with like like in way more detail. So we might actually do a response video to just that and the comments in that video because there was so much there that you guys brought. So yes, if you have anything that you would like us to follow up on, I, give me the excuse to talk more about Hyperion, <laughs> guys. The point I want to make is how Simmons uses the mundane to get the emotional feels. That is one thing I, I was going to originally point out at the beginning was so far, we've had a really horrific kind of heart of darkness uh, story from a very specific point of view in a journalistic style. And then we've had somebody who has verbose language and is all over the place and has lived like an epic tale of a life. We have somebody who's from a military background and we've gotten that. And now we get somebody whose life is the most that we can probably sympathize with as far as like a reader. No, I could identify more with feminine Kassad in terms of how I am as a person and the life I've well, lived. Wanting and to fuck garbage disposals. You remember when there was a time I went to the hospital for a little while and I told you guys <laughs> it was appendicitis? Surprise! Yeah. <laughs> Surprise! Yes, it, it brings you into that and that's how it's able to get you with the emotion. It's because this isn't like some like really rich noble dude who's been living a couple hundred years. This isn't um, some super intense military dude with something called a death wand. This isn't uh, a her- like a true horror story like the priest tale. Um, instead, we've got we've got a father and a daughter and a really heartwarming, lovely relationship that we could all wish to have for those of us with mommy and daddy issues. And then it's taken away. And I previously, I'm pretty sure I previously said in the poet's tale, no. I don't remember who I said it's for, but it's a tragedy, I said. And no, I take that back fully. This is the tragedy. Well, what's interesting, too, is that for me, I think one of the reasons I didn't find it as depressing, though, is because it's like, 
but they're gone. They're on Hyperion now. So what's Act Two? Like he's going into war for his kid, and I like I really liked that feeling of like, okay, what shoe is gonna drop? And it is this what really- metal clad blade shoe is gonna drop? And it is this really like fantastic like like start of a journey where like. It, it, it gives me Bilbo Baggins vibes where he's yes. like, he's putting yeah, his bag, like his bags, he's getting ready to go on his adventure, but he's got this like grim determination, but love. That's the thing. Saul Weintraub oozes love. And like that love, parental love going on an adventure. Mwah, I love it. Some of the other things with the mundaneness, because I once wrote a paper arguing that uh, Benjamin Button as a short story works because the ending is very sad, but it's an absurd flippin' idea. And in that story, the author leans into the absurdism so hard, even within the first paragraph, the language is his, like absurd. The descriptions are funny. It makes you laugh. And he catches you off guard with the absurdity. You buy in because you're not taking it seriously. And slowly throughout the story, things become real. And you don't notice when the absurdity starts to pull back little by little. And then in the end, it really does hit you. Like it's a gut wrencher because similar, he just poofs out of existence. Fitzgerald uses absurdity to get like, that's how he gets you. And Simmons uses the mundane to do a very similar thing because the moments that get you, like I said, are not the bombastic, like in the Shrike t- or uh, in the um, Sphinx moments. It's not really when he goes on his adventure. For me, the moments were the ones that felt like things I could have seen or experienced. So there's this one moment that really got to me where Saray is going through the attic and she like Simmons mentions that she's a bit of a pack rat. She can't, she couldn't let go of a lot of stuff. So she kept a lot of things that were sentimental to her in the attic. And it's her just going through the attic and being like, she's turning seven. A seven year old can't keep wearing an eight year old's clothes. She's getting too small. I need to find, I know I saved some of her favorite clothes. She's going to be happier if I can find these clothes. And you're just like, Oh, God damn, Saray, I am so sorry, Angel. Because, like, it's a mother going through an attic looking for something. Like, you've seen that. You know, it's maybe it was you looking in the attic for something that had sentimental value and you just can't remember for your goddamn life where it is. The struggle isn't, like, how am I going to solve this science problem? It's just, like, I want some normalcy for my, my child. It's such a mundane struggle. Those moments that are so beautiful. And then another thing, and I think one of the most useful thing, or one of the, the, the pieces that gets you slowly, is the see you later alligator, which gets used, like... As an adult, like she's, uh, he says, see you later, alligator. And uh, Rachel goes, in a while, crocodile. And like you get a bunch of times where he puts her to sleep and he says it to her. And then there's this moment when she's very young and he goes, see you later, alligator. And she laughs and she's like, what's that? And he realizes, oh God, he's hit a point where she's never heard that before. This thing that has become like a staple in their life. They've said it to each other. It was the day before she learned it. And she literally in like a childlike lisp is like, oh, wow, crocodile!" And you're just like, she's never going to say that to him ever again. And the young woman that she was, who turned out to be very, like she literally was like the epitome of what a good young woman probably would be. Every positive aspect. And his like not just that but Saul also vibes with his daughter on a scholarly level it's because she often engaged in the religion and asked like hey dad like what are you religious do you believe in god and he's like "Uh, i'm waiting to and they discuss like really heavy topics that he himself didn't realize he was engaged with but he actually is and it brought out a like as you could probably imagine a different side to him and then that's just all washed away by a reversal of time and i think this is really also encapsulated in her losing the ability to read and the ability to speak because he describes it as literally like it's the reverse of what happens with most parents like he can no longer communicate with this person at all in a way that, and he he's watching her lose it word by word versus the reversal of parents every day getting new words with which they can communicate and connect with their child. It's dementia. It's, uh, it's the forgetting of yourself. In a weird way, it's exactly, exactly the same. It's because you still have to take care of them physically. 
you still have to like remind them where they are, who they are and stuff like that. And I think the thing about amne- the amnesia dementia angle too is that so much, this is something I've thought about in the past, but so much of our lives are a constructed room of things that don't exist in the physical. So like I um, I like to make miniatures. Isn't they he cool? has a whole channel. It's called Kit Bosch. Channel. Yeah, I'll put it in the subscription. Right but anyway... I think about these and I realize that like, I'm not going to finish one today. And yet when I think about projects, I'm not going to finish one within the day. I may not even finish it within the week. So when I think about the project as a whole, why do I think of it as a completed thing? Uh, like thing. And that's because the way we conceptualize time is not actually entirely linear in that way. We kind of conceptualize time and projects. The future kind of occurs now in a weird way. And so when you don't have a future in the way that Rachel does, she can't do that very human thing of how we conceptualize existence. And that's very scary. I sat for a second while reading this part and the Shrike isn't really ever named and it's not really given any other names from the previous chapters we've been giving the uh, the Shrike, this, that, the Lord of Pain. I think it's funny that he his name is the Lord of Pain. And I mean, not like it makes sense, but me finding it, I was like, ah, I see theme um, was that he's the Lord of the pain of, of pain. And he all these characters are just rehashing really intense trauma. So it's just, he is feeding on their pain. And that makes sense, I suppose, if he impales them all on a tree, it's like vampiring all their happiness. Well, and this pain is different than the others. This isn't a physical pain. This is her cutting her out of time and reality so that she is now traveling backwards as he does. And so that's kind of an interesting change on how he causes pain yeah and i was confused also like this is also another one of those moments where i'm wondering if the shrike why does the shrike target her is it because like for example why was fen mod kassad targeted the way he was by moneta why does saul get the nightmare is it because his daughter is already on hyperion or so the way i think of it is that the shrike is moving backwards through time so he's not actually targeting them this is the end point of something that happened in their future oh god what a thought so, okay so yeah. like with fedman kassad like Moneta says this is the second time we've met so the last time he meets her will be the first time she meets him and the first time he met her remember how she was like having she was like really into it it's because she remembered all of yeah. these times that they had already even though it was her first time but overall i really liked i really enjoyed this story and again it's very different than the others and so i don't know that i would still place it as the best i think for me the just the visceral horror of the priest tale is never gonna be beaten um, but i am interested in seeing also where it goes from here because i know what the next one is about and i'm like i don't know how that's going to be as emotionally impactful as all of these have been up till this point for me i would not say it's the best story i think objectively as a tale within and of itself priest tale is the best but for me this is my favorite i when i listened to this the first time i was uh, towards the last hour i was cleaning my bedroom and changing my sheets and as i'm changing my sheets it was, I think, the part where Saray had died or, like, just afterwards at, like, and that one scene where he's describing how holding Rachel and having her little head nestled in his arm. And the arm warmth of her Gives soft him skin. such a, and I just, quiet, I didn't sob, I just quietly cried at, like, for 30 minutes as I put my bed together. Like, just Maria wiping away little tears as she puts the bed together, it just had such a profound emotional impact on me that wasn't like violently visceral, but just the story had lulled me and wooed me in a way. Like I was wooed to that emotional reaction versus, you know, the horror of seeing uh, a character I liked on a tree for seven years dying again and again. And also, you know, like the horror aspect that gets you. Um, in the first story, but this one was, it had a sincerity. Now they all have a sense of sincerity to it, but it had this emotional vulnerability to it as a story. And I felt for Saul Weintraub, like, I just, it's my favorite. It's, it's, it's for me. And again, I'm not saying it's the best, but it's, it's scholar's tale, priest's tale. I think it's poet's tale than soldier's tale was how I ranked it. I still think poet's tale is 
that is a spectacular piece of writing. And just the technicalities of how spectacular that writing is and how invested into the tone it is for his character, I just can't fully, like, I I mean, all these characters, you're sold on all these characters and who they are. But, man, there's just something about his that really just checks a box off of my, like, world building character sheet i feel like definitely this is actually objectively the best story so far it's because it engages emotion in a way that the others cannot it's because it doesn't utilize the same tools and the fact that simmons placed it where he placed it was also obviously very strategic it's because at this point we've been given really hard lines around the world and this is more of like a soft like gooey spot it was melancholy would you say it's your Favorite? Because, like, what's your ranking? It's not my favorite. Yeah, no, it's give us favorite. your favorite rankings. Poet's Tale, Priest's Tale, this one, and Soldier's. You guys are all wrong. Soldier's Tale. <laughs> I know, because of the ball slapping. N- no, the military was fun for him. Uh, oh, no, no, yeah, the Maria's right. The military, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's why I liked it. No, Soldier's Tale, I think this one, Poet's Tale, and then Priest's Tale, in terms of the ones that I like best. But in terms of quality, Priest's Tale, and then this one, and then Poet's Tale, and then Soldier's Tale. Which is kind of funny that it's almost a reverse, but that's how I am. I think also this is a more complete one than I found either the Soldier's Tale or po- uh, Poet's Tale, actually. I feel it like is. this is more complete. For it me, I, I didn't. Like, there's such a sense of, like, next step to this. Because, like, there's no resolution. What the fuck is the resolution? But there's She's an emotional, die. like, I'm going out one less, like, yeah. butch casting a Sundance kid. We're going to Bolivian army ending, I think it's called on TV tropes. Like, we're going to go out guns blazing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take my kid to Hyperion and figure out what the fuck and is going on. And not offer her on an altar in a pl- uh, In a, a burnt place, offering. As a burnt offering in, in an altar in a place in which I shall tell you. No. I know. I thought that was so funny whenever that was inserted. Um, he was like... And I will tell you to go to a place of which I will tell you. And it's just <laughs> like, go to a place of which I will tell you. It's such a biblical way of saying things where you're like, this is translated somewhat awkwardly from the original language. I'm honestly just picturing like the Shrike in a weird way in a recording room, kind of like just trying to be a little <laughs> bit melodramatic and being like, Saul, Saul, <laughs> bring me your daughter to a place of which I will tell you. And he's like, got his little birdie thing up and he's just like, and, you know, it's just, it's he's just really hardcore role-playing this god role. But yeah, thanks, guys. We just posted yesterday our uh, Soldier's Tale video, and uh, the oh, the feedback is so good. Because, like, views-wise, oh, it ain't doing well. <laughs> but the don't do that great. In the comments, and just... I find the joy yes. in the tone of the comments sustains my narcissism. More than the view count. I find more joy in monetization, but you know, the comments are nice too. No, I like the, the <laughs> comments that we get on our Hyperion videos and people yeah, no, engaging with them. Like that's for me where I get my joy. And it's why like, I'm like, no, we shall constantly do this. We got to get out of here, guys. Love you all. Our parasocial darlings. Goodbye. Goodbye.